With around 3,000 horsepower at 65 psi of boost, the ETS R35 GTR is one of the world's most powerful and fastest GTRs. It also backs that up, being the fastest GTR on the half mile at 255 mile an hour, and second fastest in the quarter with a 688 at 222 mile an hour. Now it's not too often we get to find out what goes into such a build, and we have just managed to corner JR, owner of ETS and builder and tuner of the ETS GTR to find out what actually makes this GTR so fast. But first of all, JR, obviously the engine is the key to this whole package. There's probably not a lot of VR38 based engines making anything like this sort of horsepower. Can you talk us through the basis of the engine? Well, yes, I guess so. We go through kind of the hard parts on the engine. So it's a VR38. Uh, we run anywhere from a 4.1 short stroke engine, so that's a large bore short stroke, to a 4.3, which is still large bore and stroker, uh, depending on our power requirements and the power band we want. Uh, this engine is currently a billet block. It's a will-all block. Um, then it's billet crank, rods, pistons, and the corresponding valve train, CNC heads your standard run-of-the-mill high output engine. Um, the only thing really proprietary or special about it is the head gasket sealing. I think we see that on a lot of the high boost turbocharged engines, particularly import as well, when you start really pushing a lot of boost pressure, uh, sealing that boost into the combustion chamber is the hard part. So uh, we'll let you off on that, wanting to keep a, a few secrets to yourself. I just want to talk about that billet block. So you're running the willow block you just mentioned, and we've seen the billet blocks become much more prominent over the last three or four years in particular. Now, how pivotal is the billet block to getting the sort of power levels you're currently seeing? It's it's pretty much a necessity now. So when we were at 2,000 horsepower, you can run a stock block at 2,000 horse, but if you're off on the tune at all, just a tiny bit of knock at all, we'll crack it around the head studs. Um, and there's a lot of people that just say, well, the block's weak or whatever, but it really is tuning-related errors. So once you get up to 2,500 horse or better, um, pretty much the billet block just allows it to where if you make a mistake, you're not junking the whole block. It's a sleeve or something. It's a little bit more forgiving for the tuner. Yes, a lot more forgiving. And uh, we've pretty much gone to just purely billet blocks. And yeah, they're, they would be a necessity probably at 2200 horse plus. Now, the engine really is only one part of that package, though. So obviously, the turbochargers are what's responsible for forcing that air in. So can you let us know what turbos are on the car? Yeah, so these are Precision 8385s. Um, they do have a special turbine housing that, that we machine and pretty much make ourselves. Um, that's just mainly so it's all V-band. But they are coming out with their own V-band here shortly, or I think it may be out right now. Uh, turbo system is ETS turbo system. We build in-house. Um, has some fairly large runners going to the turbo. Um, out of the turbo goes into a large air-to-water intercooler. Again, something we build. Um, it's fairly unique in that the water stays with the core the whole time. We have a large ice area um, and then it circulates the water. We have found that was much more effective than pumping the water to the intercooler. Uh, kind of learned that the hard way. Uh, now you've just mentioned the intercooler there. So I want to just ask what fuel are you running? Are you on methanol or is it a gasoline based fuel? We're on methanol. Um, a lot of people might say methanol, well why do you have an intercooler or whatnot? That was going to be my next question. A lot of people do opt to remove the intercooler when running on methanol due to its cooling properties. So yeah, I'm interested to hear your take on that. Uh, well my take is, well re regardless, we have tested it back to back. It's worth basically 150, 160 horse on this and we're not a power to weight level with the car um, where that would be a net gain. I also kind of feel, so yeah, the alcohol with its latent heat of vaporization uh, makes for a colder charge as it goes in the engine. Um, no, I, I feel if we can get the air to arrive at the intake port or at the injector, denser, I mean anyways, it's just all better. It, it purely makes more power. 
Well, if you've got the data to prove it, then there's no, it's hard to argue there. Uh, in terms of getting that fuel into the engine, that's another problem as well, because when you are running on methanol fuel, uh, you, you need somewhere in the region of two and a half times more fuel compared to gasoline to make essentially the same power. So it's obviously a huge amount of fuel flow, particularly when you're up around that 2,800, 3,000 horsepower vicinity. So can you talk us through the fuel system on the car? Yeah, so the fuel system is a, it's a mechanical pump. I'm not exactly sure what mechanical pump it is right now. Um, and then it has 12 ID2000s. But the big deal is that they run at anywhere between 160 and 200 pounds base. So like right, right now we're at about 180 pounds base pressure. Um, we have chosen to go that route over the larger injectors just because the IDs are so consistent on their opening times and we never see them drift inject, uh, one injector to the other. The other thing is we will at times turn this motor 96, 9800 RPM. And it's important that at the high RPM that you're able to open and close that injector quickly. And that's what the IDs do better than any other injector, in my opinion. I think the off the top of my head, the ID 2000s are rated at that 2000 cc somewhere around 3 bar 43.5 psi base pressure. So uh, I don't do the maths here on, on camera, but uh, obviously if you're up around 200 psi base pressure, they're going to be pouring out a, a huge amount of fuel. Uh, the thing is, though, you're limited. We've talked off camera before this interview. You're limited at the moment to just 12 injectors. So I understand there's some upgrades coming, and you'll be going to a different in inlet manifold allowing 18 injectors. Yeah, we will be going to 18 injectors. We have not, it took us a long time. We made our power about two years ago, and then we haven't had to make more power in a while. We're just now back at where we need to go look for some more power. And so that's going to be more fuel, more turbo, more boost. Um, but we went through a whole slew of just getting the car to work efficiently and stuff. Okay, so you're here at quite high altitude at Pikes Peak at airstrip attack and uh, I think today you've said you've run 253 mile an hour, was it? Yes. Okay, so the, the best of the car has run is 255 mile an hour. Can you talk us through the challenges of making power at such high altitude? Now, before we get into that, obviously when we're at high altitude the air density is lower, so one problem is making power, but there is actually an advantage with some of these faster cars because due to the low air density, it's actually easier to push the car through the air. So you sort of got to trade off their lower power, but also easier to push the car through the air. And let's talk to us about the, the power and the turbo system at this altitude. Okay, well, yeah, and, and actually you touched on a very good point of why we're here. It's not necessary, it is for that low air density to get the car through the air. But as far as making power, you know, when we arrive here, well, I'll just put out real numbers. Um, we typically run at sea level about 60% wastegate duty, uh, that re-yields 65 pounds of boost. Up here, we find ourselves completely maxed out, 90% duty, and making 55 pounds of boost. And the back pressure goes way up. Um, you know, we came here a year ago, went 255, and felt we left something on the table. The air was a lot better. You could just feel it, it was 20 degrees colder, it was just better air. Um, we find ourselves today kind of out of turbo and it's right on the edge of you know sometimes when you can't we're out of turbo so we can't throw boost at it so now we got to tune it up a little more which typically would be leaner and more timing but then you run into a situation where you go more timing you actually lose boost um, and that is what we've done we just went with a more aggressive tune um, but actually ended up slightly losing boost but the air changed a lot here um, so it was interesting today, both us and UGR, who's kind of our rival here, um, got out there at the beginning of the day. That was the best air, that's when we both went the fastest, and we'll still see if we can go faster, but it's going to be a struggle, because we're just out of turbo right now. Yeah, we've also seen a fairly decent headwind start to come up during the day, which is obviously only going to make things harder. So the solution there is to go to simply a larger turbo? Yes, that would be the simple solution. Um, I haven't been to a larger turbo than an 83. Of course, even with these 83s, um, with a motor that's two liters per side, anything that goes wrong as far as the turbo falling out of boost or anything, you can't recover. So it's time, only for the high altitude is it time for the large turbo. At sea level, we still have some turbo left. 
Okay, I want to just touch on the tuning here and also just general engine reliability. I think there's a lot of misconception out there, a lot of misunderstanding about exactly how hard it is to hold these engines together, even with the best top shelf parts and even with the best tuning. Honestly, we are pushing these sort of engines to the absolute limit and beyond, and unfortunately sometimes failures do happen. The other aspect here is even in a quarter mile drag race, we find that it's really the last 300 feet or so where the engine is really being pushed the hardest and that's where you sort of tend to see damage to the engine if it's going to happen. So here you've got another full quarter mile to go after that. Is there anything different you're doing in tuning for a half mile event compared to a quarter mile drag race? You know there really isn't. The, the quarter mile, everyone would think the half mile is harder on the engine because that extra quarter mile. Uh, because that's an extra roughly four seconds or so on boost. Um, but we, we, because of the 18 inch street tires that we have to run out here, um, you can't put the power down in gears one, two, three, and four. So really your on load time is not double. It's only about 60% uh, more or so. Um, the other thing is we just don't run the power. I mean, it takes, the most this car's dyno was 2,700 horse. That was a 63 pounds of boost. We normally run the car 65, sometimes 67. That's in a sea level quarter mile condition. And um, just to be clear as well, that's wheel horsepower on a, a dyno jet. Dyno? Yeah, that's dyno jet and that's all wheel horsepower linked. Um, so basically, up here, you know, if I had to guess what power we're making right now, probably 2100, 2200. And you may see things on your net say, oh, 2500 to go 250 or whatnot. But I guess that's the the give and take of the higher altitude. That air density we were talking about. Yeah, so we're not making the power because the air density, but we're going faster because of the thinner air. I still feel the cars are faster at sea level, net, all things considered, but you do get something unique up here and that you get to go fast and you get to be easy on your drivetrain. And actually in the half mile, you, you know, we really haven't had motor failures. Um, the tough part is the sometimes the sixth gear. These trannies just, uh, as they've been built for quarter mile, that's where you use gears one through five. So six gear has not necessarily been developed for this type of racing. So at sea level, we find ourselves sometimes stripping the six gear, where we like we come up here with the big turbos, the 83s, we typically can replace the power where a lot of people can't, and we can actually get down the track uh, because it's less load on the drivetrain. Okay, so now in terms of running this car even at a quarter mile event at sea level where you really are leaning on the engine and, and making as much power as it's capable of, what sort of uh, mechanical maintenance strategy have you got in it? Like how often are you replacing parts to ensure that the engine remains reliable out there on the strip? So basically on a quarter mile situation, if we're going to be running for six second passes at 200 and let's say 15 to 220, um, it's going to be six to eight runs on rotating assembly and then 12 to 15 runs on the valve train. Now I think a lot of people out there have the misconception that you put all of the top shelf components into the engine, you get uh, the best people in the business to put the engine together and tune it like yourselves and that engine's going to go and do a season of drag racing, 20, 30 events, uh, a bunch of passes and all you're going to do is put oil and water in it, uh, oil and fuel in it I should say and uh, it's going to be happy days so the reality however as you've just said is something completely different uh, hopefully people can factor in that if you want to race at this level the sort of cost that's going to come from replacing an entire rotating assembly every six to eight passes is, uh, is really truly significant. Coming down to a sort of a more uh, more road friendly power level obviously these cars are heavily modified for road use as well and we're still seeing plenty of R35 road cars pushing 1000 to 1500 wheel horsepower where do you see the sort of reliability at that point at that level? So what we consider good reliability for GTR um, would be a car that you don't have to tear apart for two years or so um, that would be and so obviously that means it should probably have steel rods um, that's about 1300 wheel horsepower so a 1300 wheel horsepower car We'll run about 8.50 to 8.60s um, in the quarter mile, uh, about mid 160s per mile an hour. It'll run 200 in a sea level half mile. Uh, 60 to 130s will be around three and a half seconds or so. Um, that's what we consider the reliable, fast streetcar build 
that most people should do. And, and there is, has been a misconception, and it's mainly because a lot of the shops just, almost I feel the customers are misled into thinking that you can have a 15 to 1700 horsepower GTR, just put fuel and oil in it, and it will last for years to come. And the big deal that we found is, the main limiting factor on that is the rod bearings. That basically, this is an, an even fire V6, so it has to have two rod journals um, offset between two main bearings. So they're very narrow. The bearings are only 65% the width of a regular V8 type of engine or even a four cylinder. So basically the way you don't pound rod bearings out is you go to aluminum rods. But then aluminum rods, you, you can't really run them on the street for any length of time. Now they've got to be replaced after a certain mileage if you want to remain reliable with them, correct? Yes. All right, so I think this really comes down to just breaking down those uh, myths out there in the industry that you can build 1,800, 2,000 horsepower engines and, and they're going to be as reliable as factory. Unfortunately, when you're running that sort of power, you're putting a lot of load through all of the components and something does have to give. So, look, I appreciate you being really frank and honest with us about this and hopefully those out there watching who are considering an R35 build might uh, take some knowledge from this and hopefully get a package that suits their requirements and also remains reliable. Thanks for the chat and uh, we look forward to seeing you hopefully break that 255 mile an hour later today. Cheers JR. Cheers, thank you. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson. You'll learn about performance engine building and EFI tuning and you'll also have the chance to ask questions which I'll be answering live. Remember, it's 100% free, so follow the link to claim your spot.